Hi guys, uh, I have a little embarrassment take to give you guys. Um, I just did an entire Tech Act Rewind, maybe one of our best. It was really funny. It was hilarious. And uh, the microphone was even by me. It was over there, so you couldn't hear me at all. So I'm tr going to try to recreate those same jokes here on Tech Act Rewind. Uh, I'm David Nuno. If you don't know that, you probably don't watch Tech Act Rewind. You just fell on this video. That's cool. Nick Savage is our new producer. Say hi, Nick. Howdy. You don't have to get that close. That was awkward. Okay. Um, what was your favorite part of the show today? I already know your answer, but just what was your favorite part of the show? Uh, the interview with uh, Mike Bratton made me very uncomfortable. In a good way. In a good way. You got to watch. Zoe, your favorite part? Uh, the same. As Mike. Okay, I know what you thought. You thought I was a little mean. I thought you were very stern. Very to the point, but I enjoyed it. I liked it. A little conflict. Simon Nuno, I haven't seen. So, what these young people don't know is I enjoy conflict. I really do look forward to it. I didn't expect the interview to go that direction. It did. Uh, he's the guy who said that uh, Sam Pittman is better than Jimbo Fisher. I disagree with that. He's going to come on our show. I've got to stand up for our guy. I mean, hello, what metrics is he using? You'll see that in the interview. Good show. Uh, we also had 22 and 22, Layden Robinson on the program. Uh, we got a little Texas A&M history there on the baseball side, Little League side, and also a Maroon and White Report, all in one little interview. You'll love that. And uh, we did get a fall camp update from Coach Fisher. His press conference was the day before. We used some of those bites. I spliced in my thoughts in that. It's Tech Sacks Rewind. All right, my friend. Number six is? The War Daddy, Layden Robinson. What? That was at least two years ago, right? Yeah, it's Co uh, Cole, Cole Kubelek called yep. him that. Because he got into the game against uh, South Carolina and just just obliterated the guy in front of him. Actually, lift with a block, t knocked him off his feet upward and backward. Right. And uh, Cole Kubelex, you know, was was uh, he likes offensive line play, and uh, I guess he he watches everybody and he found saw that and he just put that out on Twitter. Look at this war daddy, Layden Robinson. And that gave you a glimpse of what was to come. Yep. And uh, I thought last year uh, he just reinforced that he was a big-time player in the offensive line, even though he played hurt. I remember watching uh, – you were there. He uh, limped off the field at Colorado. He strained to walk, yep. but he played almost every play. And I can't remember him missing a game. So uh, he played hurt and he played He played well. hurt a lot, yeah. And he played very well. And he is really the captain of that offensive line now. He is the, the leader of that group uh, by the way he works, the way he plays, and just his personality. He has the experience. He has the experience. He's, but he's got a contagious personality. Yeah, he he's does. a very nice guy who obviously, obviously plays really mean. smart. Yeah. Really smart. And uh, he was, what was in, uh, in uh, uh, Atlanta, he was what? Comparing himself to John Wick. Right? Remember? He was saying, I'm the John Wick. I asked him if he had a dog. He said no, but I, I guess it means he's just an enforcer. An enforcer he's going to yeah. go out and um, not take not, any. He's not going to take any lies, but boy, he, may, he, might, he might break your spirit, and I bet he does. I mean, he, he, you know what? I'm thinking about that because I didn't hear him say that. Oh, okay. I see it now because John Wick, have you seen the movies? I saw one of them. Yeah. Um, he's a very nice, kind of soft spoken guy. And then you mess with him. Yeah. Oh, he's going to take care of you and your friends and their friends. Right. And that's what, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's Layden Robinson. Layden Robinson is really, really good as, uh, as we see with him being, yeah. being preseason All-American. Um, that's one position. You know, that's one, he's one of those guys that Jared Hawker was, was good. I mean, he was good. And he had an excellent year, and he did great things in 2020. But with a healthy – Layden Robinson, you're better at that position than you were even with Jared Hawk. You think about our top 10 list, right? Three offensive linemen on that top 10 <laughs> list uh, and, and Layden really being the catalyst of that group. Um, and, you know, he could be potentially a first, second round pick in the NFL draft. In a couple years, we expect that same kind of uh, momentum for Bryce and for Reuben Fathery as well. What a group. Uh, yeah. and, and, and he really, I forget which game it was, but once he got going... Everybody else fell into place. Yeah. You know, um, it's third and one. Uh, I'm running right, and I'm running right behind Layden Robinson because that guy, is a, he's a road grader. Uh, he'll, he'll knock you backwards. He will uh, – I mean, he, he's a real physical guy, but, you know, he's pretty good in pass coverage too. I mean, he's a 
He's going to, I believe uh, he's an NFL player and probably a, a second day pick. So I'm going to remind people, I don't, I don't, there was at this time last year, it was no, we expected Layton Robinson to start, but it was not a guarantee, right? Because I remember uh, interviewing him before I started at Tech Sags, and he was like, yeah, this my, my goal is to be a starter, but we gotta, I got to work through it. Well, and, that sounds to me, you know, the guy that got the humbleness, right. humility. We all expected it, but, but remember the way we're talking about Kenyon Green, right? Like, how, how are you going to replace Kenyon Green? He's gone, and, he, and Kenyon had a, a few years of this. But then you have a guy like him who steps up into that kind of category of player, potential first-round pick on that offensive line. Uh, yeah, I'm not— he may. I'm not going to say he's going to be as good as Kenyon because that's, no, no. that's, that's not he fair to him. He might be, but that's not fair to him. Yeah, uh, I'm just, just saying think impact he's on NFL, the line. Oh, I think he's their best offensive line. Yeah, uh, and I think with he and Fathery together, that right side, you can say, okay, I got the right side. It's taken care of. I don't have to worry about it. Let's let's start working on the left side and see what we got here. But uh, again, he's the most experienced guy. He's the senior member of that line, even though he's just a junior. And uh, He's proven, and he's he's uh, like you said, he's a really nice guy off the field. But on the field, he's uh, you he gets that three point stance, and that, that's a bull. That's a bull, yeah. and that he, that defensive lineman is nothing but a, a a red flag being waved in front of him. He's going to go attack. Yeah, I want to talk some SEC football. Uh, we're going to bring on here Michael Bratton, SEC Mike, that SEC uh, podcast, joining the show. He was with us about a year ago, and Michael, full disclosure, man, um, when I booked you. I didn't realize you're the one that said that Sam Pittman was better than Jimbo Fisher. I remember when that went viral. I did not know it has been brought to my attention. Um, how are you doing, man? Oh, oh boy. We're starting with that. Okay. Oh. I, I'm doing great, David. It's, anytime I get to come on the number one Texas A&M show, one of the best shows in the SEC, I'm very appreciative to be here. And no, you had to expect me to ask about that. So um, I, I'm going to cue up the clip. I, I honestly, when I when I, I would have booked you back then, had I known it was you, I think it was during SEC media days. Uh, I didn't know yeah. when I booked you. It was brought to my attention. And I'm like, this dude doesn't believe that. That's nah. There's no way. So we're going to play the clip. We'll talk about it. But then I want to talk about SEC big. I don't want to make it the bulk of our interview. I want to talk SEC with you. But let's play the clip real quick. Who in the West? Okay. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that better coaching staff, better quarterback, better offensive line. Jimbo Fisher gets touted as this quarterback guru. The last quarterback he had that he coached up was Jameis Winston. That was nearly a decade ago. And I loved what Kellen Mond did, but he had three years with him, and he never got any better. I thought he was better as a sophomore than he was a senior. I don't care what the, the record was during the COVID year. We need to stop pointing to the COVID year, saying we went 9-1. and one. It's every other year. That seems to be the norm there in College Station, losing four games. I'm not saying a and is going to lose four games again, but you stack them up against Arkansas. I like, again, Arkansas coordinators are better. The quarterback's better. The offensive line's better. I think Sam Pittman's a better coach than Jimbo Fisher. All right, Mike, by what metric? Come on, dude. You don't believe that. You're just saying it. Like, by what metric? And look, I have a lot of respect for Sam Pittman. I think he's done amazing in his first two years there. But what metric is Sam Pittman better than Jimbo Fisher? Wait, I'll answer that in just a second, David. But hey, you skipped over the part. I didn't. I'm not out here making the uh, easy eight and four jokes. I said they're going. They're not going to lose four games. So don't put me in that crowd. But. How about this? I don't know if you guys uh, are familiar with Dave Bartu, CFB Matrix. I think yeah, he's one yeah. of the best in the business. He does coaching grades, and they're not. This is not his opinion. This is his model. It's a mathematical uh -huh. equation. And according to Dave Bartu, all Power Five coaches, if you remove the guys that were in their first year last year, mm -hmm. Jimbo Fisher had the worst coaching grade in college football. I mean, that's that's pretty bad right there. And Sam Pittman. I mean, I think in the last two years, he's done a better job than anybody in the country. I know we, we typically don't grade coaches on a two-year scale, but you got to remember, this was an Arkansas program. It was a laughing stock, not only of the SEC, but the entire country. I mean, they hosted Vanderbilt, who is the joke of the SEC now. They lost by two touchdowns to Vanderbilt at home. I mean, that thing was a train wreck. Turning around two years later, he's winning nine games, New Year's, uh, New Year's Day Bowl win over Penn State, I believe. I mean, I think the, the job Sam Pittman done is incredible, whereas Jimbo Fisher, I'm scratching my head trying to figure out why you know we're, we're elevating him as one of the best in the game when, again, well, outside of that COVID year, 
I, how, how can you say outside not... of that COVID year, did Alabama win the national championship in 2020? Did Mac Jones have that season? Do we count that season for Mac Jones? Do we count it for Saban? They went 9-1 and one with an all-SEC schedule. Um, I don't understand how you take that season away. If you want to go in parts, we can discuss. Right. I have a so uh, let's talk about Aggie baseball. And uh, what, what do you remember about being named the captain? Uh, you know, I, I just, when I came to AM, I had two personal goals. One of them was I, I was only on a partial scholarship when I came here, and I saw some of the other guys on the team, and I knew that I, at least I felt like I was a better player than some of them. And my goal was to, one, be in the starting lineup as soon as I could, and then to get a full scholarship. Halfway through my, my freshman year, I did become a starter and played, basically started every game from halfway through my freshman year until I graduated. Got a full scholarship, and uh, it was my first three years – we had great hitting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were just loaded with hitters. Our pitching was good, but our hitting was excellent. The last year, we lost most of those hitters, so our hitting was good, but our pitching was excellent. We had Hoot Gibson was one of our pitchers. He's in the Hall of Fame here. Clint Thomas, David Lockett. Uh, but we had a lot of young guys, and uh, I just went out every day and tried to improve myself. I uh, didn't talk. I wasn't a trash talker. We didn't have trash talkers back then. And uh, – I guess maybe a lot of those younger guys looked up to me because yeah. I, I didn't treat them like they were below me. Because a lot of times when you come in as a freshman, the upper class will give you a really hard time. They did that to us when we were freshmen. But uh, we, uh, at least I, I always treated them just like I'd want to be treated. What do you think about the job Schloss is doing here? It's amazing. I right. mean, uh, you know, uh, I played for Tom Chandler. He was the coach for, I want to say, about 25 years. Loved playing for him. Great coach, player's coach. Then Mark Johnson was here, and, and uh, they had a lot of success. And uh, I thought it was a great hire when they made it because he had so much success at TCU. And uh, I don't think anybody expected this. Right. I mean, they started off the year kind of slow. and uh, They figured it out, though. They figured it out and uh, uh, did an amazing job. I mean, the future looks as good as ever. That. I, I want to kind of go through uh, Jimbo's press conference yesterday because he had some interesting things to say, as we all know – the scrimmage is Saturday, the second scrimmage, and it looks like to be the last scrimmage. Um, you know, the, he he did make a point of saying that they do a lot after and during, and like, but they're talking about live bullets with real tackling and yada yada yada. They're going to be doing that, and uh, he stressed the importance of how uh, big this particular one is. Yeah, I mean, you, you want to clean up uh, the mind. You want to make sure your operational skills of getting plays, getting calls, communication on the field. Those types of things, man, you, and those are things as a coach. You know, you keep worrying about production, but we worry about can we get lined up right? Can we get the right calls? All the communications being made. Who's making the communications? Those types of things are getting better. You know, your, your shot clock, I say, you know, getting plays in, not getting delays, not having self-inflicted wounds, those types of substitutions. Those things I think are all very critical. And then the execution's got to go up. You know what I mean? Then you, your execution goes up as the longer you're in practice, the longer you're in camp. Each, each scrimmage you have, it gets better, it gets better, and it should. And that's, you know, those will be big things we're looking for. Will there be another scrimmage after Saturday? No. Okay. And then not my... a live scrimmage. Not a live. I mean, we'll do situ. We we situationally scrimmage every day. I mean, what we're saying in a scrimmage, we do it every day. We may not tackle, or we're hard thudding and physical, but what we do in practice, I mean, there's there are different sections that go that way. All right, a couple things to think about that. I think sometimes we take for granted, like these kids have been playing football their whole life, but there's a, a process, a, a crispness that you have to be ready, and once it goes live, you have to be ready to roll. And that's the thing uh, about these scrimmages that he was stressing yesterday was like, we, I mean, we've got to be clean and crisp. We have got to be ready. There's certain things we need to speed up, certain things we need to get better. Uh, but they work on that all year long. Um, they're, they're working on that, all these practices, but that's like the dress rehearsal. And if you've ever been uh, at an event as an MC or there's some kind of choreography, like there's a lot of practice that goes into it. Yes, it's a game, but as many times as you can go real live because there's practice speed and then there's live speed, right? And that goes for everything, jogging, a radio show, uh, and a sporting event. There's a different level when it, go, when it, when it becomes man-to-man -man, when it becomes go time, there's a different level. And can you, have you drilled down everything correctly until you've gotten it perfect? And it's never perfect enough, but you, that's what you strive for, each rep to get to that. Uh, so this is where we close the show where he already knows what to say. So instead of you telling me what you're supposed to do first, what's the third thing you're supposed to do? 
uh, chair. Okay. Zoe, what's the first thing you're supposed to do? Hi. Kay, what's the fifth thing you're supposed to do? Comment. Fifth? Okay. Comment. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't really have a <laughs> fifth one. So uh, they did the fake courtesy laugh. That's cool. I get it. I'm old. Uh, it's TechSax Rewind. We'll see you next week.